All right, thanks very much. I've been watching those numbers dwindle. But it's good to be last. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is um, work that has been done by a PhD student here at JCU. His name is Prong Lei, as well as uh, one of the MSc students that we started earlier this year, Grace Manastar, who, who started to work on some of the fluid inclusion data from Tech Help. So I, uh, I'll present uh, a range of results that we've got so far at Tech Help. Uh, why Tech Hill? Tech Hill is a deposit in the southern part of the Mary Kathleen Belt. It was mined over a very short period of time. It was never written up very properly. There were very few studies done on it. And by the time uh, people started to notice uh, how wonderful that deposit was, it was already mined out and people moved on. So no nothing has ever really been written up outside of company reports and very little of the data is in the public domain. Uh, yet it represents an absolute unique uh, deposit style in, in the Mount Isaac rock. So GSQ decided that uh, it, was, it was very worthwhile to try and do a PhD project on this. Got two photographs here. This is what Tick Hill looked like at the end of the mining, uh, mining uh, life in 1995 when the pit was still open. This is what it looks like today. Um, when we started with this project, there was very little information available in the public domain, like I said, and we had to rely on a few company reports. We didn't have access to the old uh, mine data either. So when we first went to the pit, we had to rely on photographs like this to try and work out for ourselves what the actual mineralized zone really would have looked like and where we should do uh, our mapping and sampling in the pit as far as we could get to it. So a few, um, oh, sorry, so this here is Troll standing very proudly. He couldn't make it today to present uh, his information, so I, I, I'll do it for him. So I'll give you a general background, go into the geology, take you through the structural controls, the alteration, parigenesis, and fluid controls. Uh, so some general background first to the deposit itself. It's situated in the very southern part of the Mary Kathleen domain, which is that light blue stuff here in the middle. Uh, just at the point where uh, the outcrop starts to disappear a little bit in Mount Isa Block as well. Uh, it was mined between 1992 and 1995 by Carpenteria Gold. It produced about half a million ounces at 22 grams per ton. And it made a lot of money over three years. Uh, it was the lowest, uh, uh, lowest um, cost gold producer in the world. I didn't realize this until fairly recently in 1992. Uh, so it was actually a very, very profitable mine. And the reason for that was that it's extremely coarse grained and almost all the gold is 3 million. So a few uh, slides to show you the early work. So the deposit was, was uh, discovered over here uh, from uh, stream bed uh, geochemistry. So they found an anomaly 6.9 ppb, which was fought up, fought up the creek and ultimately Tick Hill was discovered that way. There was a gossip on the surface, but it wasn't directly above the surface, so it threw people off with the initial drill holes. Ultimately, the deposit was made as an open pit that went underground on a decline down to 240 meters. And as, as the mining progressed, there was absolutely spectacular high-grade ore in that, that that ran in kilos per, per ton with lots of free golds like this. And uh, very, very little sulfide associated with it. And these samples have become real collector's items, which made it very hard for us to track down samples to do the PhD study on because nobody wanted to part with the few samples they had stored in their cupboards. Uh, or what's more, they told us that they didn't have any sample when we found afterwards that they did. Anyway, so after mining, what one of the things, so the ore body is very, very linear and there is a copper anomaly associated with the gold, but the copper sits in the football, mostly in the football of the ore. And it's not clearly, uh, there's no clear sulfide mineralization directly linked to the gold ore itself. But I'll come back to that in a moment. All right, so let's go into the geological setting. One well, of the first things we've been doing is trying to get the context of the deposit right. So in the southern part of the Mary Kathleen domain, the scholars in green of the is the equivalent of the Corella formation, or at least it was mapped as the equivalent of the Corella formation. The light blue of the is the Aguilar formation, and the stuff to the left 
Uh, these brahms are various types of granitic gneisses that have been linked to the calcadian basement with, with younger intrusions into it. And then in the domain, the, the Mary Kathleen domain, you've got local granites, which are referred to as the Tick Hill granites. To the right, you've got the Pilgrim Fault, and then there's Norma Outcrop, where you get into younger rocks. And, and to the left, you basically get into the calcadian domain. So we took a whole bunch of samples to sort of understand the context of the deposit, and that's where we initially started. And I've shown you some of the results here. So a Calcadoon basement is definitely there, 1850, in, in a couple of places. It actually pops up inside the Mary Kathleen domain as well in some of the granites. All of those synthectonic granites that are mapped within the um, Corella Formation are all around 1775, 1780. Uh, some of them go up to 1,800 million years, the ones towards the west. And then we did a whole bunch of sampling in the deposit itself to, to try and determine the age of the mineralization and the age of the host rocks mineralization, but I'll get, to, I'll get back to that in a moment. So with, re, with regards to mapping, a few points. Uh, so there again is the southern part of the Mary Kathleen domain, which basically cannot uh, be followed beyond the Mount Bruce Fault in the south over here. The open pit is sitting over here, and it's sitting in the eastern limb of a big upright fault structure, which is referred to as, as the, the Tick Hill Sinkline. So essentially what you've got is a very, very uh, strongly transposed, high-strain high myelinitic um, upper amphibolite to lower granulite fish, it's nice fabric, that is tightly folded around these upright faults that are referred to as D2 faults. So we've got S1 fabrics, uh, which are uh, myelinitic and recrystallized, uh, folded around upright D2 folds. If you then go into the pit itself, these, so here we're in the eastern limb of this upright uh, Tick Hill fault. Um, we've got a series of faults, uh, faulting events cutting through it. Uh, there is early faulting, which we've referred to as D3, that's normal faulting associated with uh, northeast trending structures and east-west trending structures, and they cross-cut by later faults, which are strike slip faults, which are D4. And in cross-section, uh, the ore body is dipping uh, with, with uh, the main Nisic layering to the west of about 60 degrees. The ore body, as you map uh, the, the high-grade ore zones on top of the structure, very closely follows one particular shear zone that sits at the boundary of the foliation truncation plane in the, in, in the, in the dominant uh, foliation. If you look at the regional geophysics, uh, two things to point out. Uh, this was picked up early on by, uh, by MIM when they did their regional uh, exploration after the mine was, uh, was, was mined out and they were looking for other tick hill like deposits in the region. They picked up on this uh, very distinct anomaly that you can see over here in the Helimag. Uh, some of this, like over here, is due to the Tick Hill Sinform, which I just pointed out. So you can actually see that Sinformal structure going through, but it's overprinted on top of that, does seem to be a round, round structure that at the time was interpreted as a potential intrusion with Tick Hill, uh, the Tick Hill pit shown over here sitting at the northeast corner of that intrusion. If you look at uh, some more uh, uh, magnetics, aeromagnetics, you can see that the Tick Hill deposit is very closely associated with the zone where the magnetic signature is being destroyed, and that's because magnetite is being replaced by hematite. In terms of the host lithologies, the main host lithologies in the pit, from going from the rim of the pit inwards, is uh, calcilicates, amphibolitic calcilicates, amphibolites, there's quartzites. Uh, like this one, and in the core of the deposit, you've got a combination of calcilicates, biotite schists with a fair bit of selenite in places in it, and um, these uh, coarser felspathic myelinites. And it's especially these coarser felspathic myelinites, which have been altered afterwards by chloride and hematite, etc., that, that gives it a very particular coloration. Uh, that have become uh, the focus of attention because they host most of the high-grade ore and they've been referred to as glassstone at the time they were mining it. And there's some absolute spectacular examples of that glassstone there. The glassstone itself has had a variety of interpretations put on it. Um, a lot of people noticed early on that much of the high-grade ore, the, the, the gold, was actually granoblastic and had the same 
texture is the myelinites in which it occurs. So it had that same granoblastic texture you see in these rocks. Some of the, go the, 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 the cause was, uh, occurred as inclusions in peak metamorphic minerals like hornblend and, and, and clinopyroxene. And people started suggesting that much of this ore must have been very early and that the corticospathic units in which they occurred could have been early sedimentary units. Uh, so Trong has done a fair bit of geochem on these samples, crushed, crushed them up, uh, compared them with the rocks in the, in the surrounding units. And these corticospathic units, myelinites that act as host to the gold mineralization are granitic in composition, They've got rare earth, uh, rare earth patterns that are very, very flat with depleted rare earth uh, mineralization and they're geochemically identical to the Tekel granites. And they're also the same age as the Tekel granites. And their rare earth element patterns are actually characteristic for, for migmatites. So we interpret these things as migmatitic, leucogranic uh, intrusions and pectoral intrusions that have intruded into that calcilicate and fibrolite sequence at 1775 million years. Uh, and they're not sediments as such. They are actually igneous intrusion. In terms of the structural setting, again, we rely a little bit on historical photographs to actually tell us what types of structures that were, were being targeted during the mining stages. Uh, this is what that same corner looks like today. You can't see any, uh, all that much anymore. And much of the most interesting part of the deposit, which is over here, has collapsed. But in the old photographs, you can see that the fracture systems and the old alteration systems of the high-grade ore zones are still present. There's a little bit of seepage coming out of these fractures as well. So first of all, the early uh, myelinitic fabric in the rock is, is uh, a very strong recrystallized uh, myelinite. It's, it's essentially a blaster myelinite, if you want to use the right terminology. The host rocks are these uh, sediments, as well as these intrusive nicotinic nickel granites, which are 17, 75 million years in age. Uh, the foliation is fairly homogeneous, uh, dipping west at about 60 degrees with a strong mineral lineation on it. One thing that's important is that the long axis of the high grade ore envelope is not parallel to the mineral lineation. So it's not the deformation that is stretched out the lineation has been suggested in the past. Uh, but the long axis of the mineralization and you know, the mineral elongation and deformation that occurred early on are unrelated features. This foliation is a composite foliation of both uh, S1 and D2 fabric elements. And it gets recrystallized during this later alteration and recrystallization. The uh, main deformation that's associated with the mineralization is a set of shear zones. The main shear zone runs through the guts of the ore body and that's where the ore body seems to be concentrated as well and that's actually a structure that was laid laid down early on during D1. It's a foliation truncation plane during the earliest deformation that gets reactivated as a sinistral normal uh, shear zone during the mineralization event and it's associated with conjugate sets of normal faults that run east-west and sort of abut into the main shear zone over there and the highest rate ore sits in that portion and follows the intersection between that structure and that structure downwards. This early deformation is associated with metasomatic alteration coming out of these east-west fracture systems and they often have this halo of feldspar quartz alteration associated with it. We've dated material from those halos from drill core and it comes out at around 15, 25, 15, 59 years. It's also associated with pegmatite veins. Many of these pegmatite veins have got sigmoidal uh, or national uh, quartz veins associated with it that are consistent with a normal shear sense. Uh, and those pegmatite veins date at 15, 22 million years as well. So if you look at the pit itself and see where the mineralization is, this is a photograph of the face when it was being mined. And the long strike of the face is where the main ore zone was. That phase is still visible in the pit. It's got these unational alteration systems and metasomatic uh, uh, feldspar quartz halos in it. And these pegmatite veins, so that pegmatite vein is this pegmatite vein over here with unational uh, quartz veins that give you the center shear at the time of mineralization. And that vein was dated, lots of zircon in it, very good, well-constrained age of 15, 22 million years. 
The intersection of these fault zones, the east-west ones, these ones, and these north-south trending ones, that intersection is exactly slim parallel to the long axis of your body. And so it's not the mineral lineation, but it's these later structures that determine the distribution of that ore. If you look at the northeast phase, you see the same thing. You see all of these fracture systems that have now collapsed. Some of them are associated with breaches. A lot of them are associated with, like I said, these alterations, the metasomatic alteration halos. And the high grade, highest grade portion of the ore sits in this area here where these, these fracture systems were interfering with these northeast trending fractures. And all of this was normal faulting and the veins came in during, uh, during extension. So let's look at the alteration associated with mineralization. So um, Trong has gone back to all of these drill cores. Carnaby Resources gave us access to the drill cores last year and he's logged a whole bunch of them and re, re, um, uh, re reconstructed the alteration um, perigenesis around the high grade ore zones. Uh, in the distal domains, we've got a lot of chloride hematite clay alteration, mostly spectite, but with elite as well. As you go inwards, you get uh, chloride epidote, very prominent chloride epidote alteration, which is partly responsible for that glass star nomenclature. And there's a fair bit of epidote and feldspar coming in as well. There's both orthoclase and, and, and albite in, in these rocks. As you go closer in, um, you get a lot of hematite coming in and you get typical red rock alteration. So this rock uh, runs at 177 grams per ton. It's really high grade, lots of free, uh, free uh, uh, visible gold in it. And the rocks become highly silicified and you get these characteristic uh, core parallel fracture systems coming through. And these core parallel fractures have uh, often sheeted quartz veins associated with them. And they're basically the east-west fractures that I showed you in the previous slide in the northeast corner of the pit. And then right in the guts of your body, you get lots of these parallel laminations of, of gray laminated sheeted veins of quartz, which are often sub-millimeter in length and very difficult to differentiate from the myelinetic uh, fabric in which they've intruded. And along some of these sheeted veins, you get these spectacular enrichments of gold. Um, in some parts, in the hanging wall in particular, uh, in the more distal parts, you also have a very strong magnetite alteration, but that magnetite is early and predates the gold phase. It's overprinted by hematite and destroyed by hematite. If you look at the glass stones itself, of these quartz of feldspathic myelinites, and look at the different stages of mineralizing fluids coming through, you've got an early stage of quartz feldspar magnetite alteration mostly sitting on these east-west uh, steep fractures. That gets overprinted by the main mineralizing stage, which, which is associated with infiltration of feldspars, orthoclase albite. And then you get an overprint by red rock alteration. A lot of hematite comes in together with chloride and epidote and a late stage of, again, uh, feldspar alteration that destroys some of that red, red, uh, red rock alteration. This, these two stages, two and three, is when most of the gold is coming in. The gold is not just sitting in the glass stones, though, in the course of those spectrum units. It's actually sitting across the different lithologies. You can find high-grade gold in the amphibolites. You can find, find portions of high-grade gold in quartzite. And you can find high-grade gold in biotite schist as well. So the gold overprints the other units. And they are affected by similar feldspar quartz alteration and layer parallel lamina veins where the high grade gold gets deposited. But uh, quartz feldspathic rocks make up the bulk and they give rise to these spectacularly altered glass stones, and that's caught the attention of everybody. So there is a few things if you look in detail at the mineral paragenesis in there and the zonation patterns of the metals in particular. First of all, Virtually all the gold is free, free gold, and the gold contains very, very little silver, less than 1% silver, for as far as we've seen. Um, if you look at the gold in the ore zone itself, it does occasionally occur with um, sulfites, but wherever it occurs with sulfites, the sulfites look extremely unhappy. 
and they look resorbed. Uh, and the same with magnetite. There's sometimes magnetite in there, but the magnetite is also unhappy. And if you look in more detail, there is new sulfide, sulfide growth, but it's actually associated with stage four, uh, late stage uh, carbonate veining. Uh, and most of the sulfides, the chalcopyrite, sits outside of uh, where, where the gold is. It sits in the immediate football, but you also find it in the hanging wall. Uh, if you do uh, correlation uh, uh, diagrams of gold and cobalt and copper, there is no correlation between uh, copper and gold or cobalt and gold on a meter scale. Uh, on a regional scale, there is a much stronger correlation between copper and the host rock types than there is between copper and the gold. And the fact that there's a lot of copper sitting in the base, uh, in, in the football of the, of the gold has a lot to do with the calc silicates that sit in the football of the gold, although some of it may have been remobilized. So it, it looks potentially that as the gold bearing fluids come in, that um, the copper that was there and that was linked to host rocks and, and earlier is uh, uh, partly uh, dissolved. Uh, the copper drops out, the gold drops out, and the copper goes into solution and moves out together with the sulfur to form this, this uh, chocolate pyrite uh, halo around the ore body. One other thing about the core of the ore body there is breccia ore. It's not really true breccia, it's often these sheeted veins that are incredibly intense and break up the early myelinated fabric. A few things about the fluids. Now there's a number of odd things about uh, uh, the, the Tick Hill deposit and I just want to point out a few oddities. We don't necessarily what it means. Um, many of the zircons in the rocks, the intrusives around Tick Hill, show these incredibly uh, corroded looking and partly dissolved zircon drains. They still give you ages, but the, z the zircons look very odd. And they seem to be concentrated in intrusions around the deposit or whatever that means. But to do this, you need to have some pretty aggressive fluids in the source of these zircons. Now this happens with the host rocks to uh, take hill uh, with, with rocks that are dated at 1770, 1780. The other thing you notice is this incredibly uh, resorbed and corroded nature of many of the sulfides in the deposits. The sulfides weren't happy when the gold, the gold came in. You can see this uh, in places where you have a coarse grain gold, which is surrounded by this halo, this fine dusting of gold as well, suggesting that there's some remobilization of the gold at some point. And you often have the gold highly clustered. Uh, you get very little gold in most places and then suddenly you have 10 centimeters that is really running at ridiculous rates with, with highly clustered gold. The gold can sit in the peak metamorphic assemblages. So you find gold in plagioclase, you find gold in cave feldspar, you find gold in hornblende, and you can find gold in uh, CPX. And all of this has led uh, in the past to suggestions that there must have been early gold in this system that predates the metamorphism and the myelinization, and that yes, there is later alteration, but that alteration has uh, remobilized some of this early coal. Um, if you look in detail at much of this, and you look at detail in the home blends and the pyroxenes and in the plagioclase and all these metamorphic minerals, you actually see lots of microfractures and you invariably see that the gold grains sit either along healed microfractures or microfractures that are still visible. So yes, you do find textually very odd positions of gold, but you also find lots of evidence of microfractures and it would appear that the gold actually ultimately comes in through these microfracture networks. We've been looking at the fluids associated with uh, quartz that has got gold inclusions in it. Um, and there is a number of things. This is preliminary work done by Grace Manastar, so I don't want to dwell on it too much, but let me point out some of the preliminary results. The fluids are aqueous, there's only water in there, but there's often a gaseous phase in there as well with highly variable sizes of the, the bubbles in there. It's a boiling system by the looks of it. You find lots of uh, hematite and salt inclusions in there, sometimes large salt inclusions. So these, these fluids were clearly hypersaline and they were highly oxidized. Um, and one thing, there is absolutely no CO2 in any of these fluids. We haven't found any CO2 bubbles. 
So currently we're stepping up to look at fluid inclusions from the surrounding rocks if they too don't contain, uh, contain CO2 or whether this is just typical for uh, the quartz that surrounds uh, the, the, the gold. It's a little bit too, too early to say. But these fluids are hypersaline oxidized hydrous fluids with no CO2 and no sulfur. If you look at the later carbonate veins that cut through the deposits, so these are pulse mineralization, they actually contain very similar looking fluid inclusions with the same sort of things, boiling, boiling textures, highly, high, highly saline, and also with uh, um, uh, hematite inclusions in it. But in, in this case, you do find uh, pyrite, chocopyrite associated with these carbonate veins. Uh, this is the last slide, just quickly, um, some, some uh, oxygen isotope results. Uh, the oxygen isotopes from all the different types of quartz, from all the different generations of veins that we've dated from early to, to late, from 1800 to 1530, from within the pit and from outside the pit, almost all gave a very narrow range of oxygen isotope values of between 11 and, and 13. Uh, these, these values occasionally go up to up to 19, 20, um, and if you compare them with what was done before in, in the past, there are some historical data sets from MSC theses and some work that uh, MIM did initially during the exploration phases, we find the exact same results. If you compare this with what's available for the Mary Kathleen Bell, you'll see that it is very similar to what you find for the uh, red rock alteration, the optimization event uh, that is widespread across uh, the entire Mount Isa block. Uh, that gives 11, 12, 13 uh, uh, oxygen isotope values as well. So clearly there is a very uh, uh, strong fluid flow of a homogenizing fluid that's gone through the whole thing. There is no clear evidence that any of these fluids are directly related with intrusion. So in summary, the gold is mostly syn D3. There are tantalizing suggestions that some of that mineralization may have been early, uh, but as far as we can tell, it's associated with big alteration systems and intrusive dikes and metasomatism that dates at around 2025. So the gold is, is probably late Isaac. It's associated with magnetic law, very few sulfites which are destroyed by the altering fluids. Strong quartz albite uh, chloride epidote alteration associated with it. Normal faulting, it comes in at a stage of normal faulting uh, and brecciation. Uh, and there's pegmatite emplacement, and perhaps there is an intrusion underneath it. We have seen no direct evidence for it. Um, the gold is hosted by leucogranites uh, that originated this probably as microtites in 1775. Uh, there is no clear relationship on a small scale with copper cobalt, and the copper cobalt that we're seeing may well be primary and linked to the host rocks. Uh, the fluid appears to be hypersaline and is pure water with no CO2 in it at, at all, with abundant hematitis inclusions in the fluid inclusions. Um, the geophysics hints at an underlying intrusion, and the oxygen isotopes don't tell us much other than that the fluids are uh, all the same, or the oxygen isotope system is pretty much all the same everywhere. So thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. You brought, brought up the, the end of the field really well, um, and we still have a, a whole bunch of people attending, so really appreciate um, everybody mm -hmm. sticking in. It's been a, a long, but I think really interactive and, and great session. Um, before we take questions, because there are a few, I'm just going to ask, um, Rick and Matt, if they would mind starting to put people through um, to participate in drinks. If anyone wants to stick around for drinks, I know it's now quite late, but you're very welcome to. Um, and in the meantime, Paul, um, I've got a couple of questions. One from Ian Withnall, um, maybe more of a comment. Maximum depositional zircon ages and stratigraphic relationships indicate that the Corella formation in the Mary Kay area is younger than 1755 million years. The host rocks here are intruded by 1770 to 1780 million year granites, so must be an older pre or sin argilla sequence. 
any ideas on its regional context. It sort of validates David Blake's idea of an older Corella sequence that he proposed back in the 1980s. Absolutely. So Blake already made reference to Corella 1, Corella 2. And clearly this is not Corella in the way it was defined further north. And once you get south of, uh, uh, what's it, uh, the, the big fault there? Uh, the Plum, Plum Mountain Fault. Paul. The Plum, Plum Mountain Plum. Fault. The sequence changes and you get into a different sequence that is more akin to the Agila formation than the Corella formation. Okay. Thanks. And um, I know we had some questions in the chat. So Marcus Tomkinson is asking, is there any molly enrichment? Uh, this is quite reminiscent of the white dam deposit in the Kernamona and also Renko in Zimbabwe. Any pyrosamolite in the FIs? All right, so I do happen to know Renko. I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that in a moment. Um, we have one record of molybdenite, visible molybdenite in drill core that was in the MIM records. We went chasing up that drill core, which took a while to find, and we couldn't find the molybdenite. The geochemistry shows very, very little molybdenite, and uh, we've been looking for it, but no, there is no molybdenite enrichment. As far as Renko, this doesn't look anything like Renko. Renko is a green shear fashion set of shears that cut through granulite, all right. But this deposit, uh, the fluids are oxidizing, saline fluids, the sulfites are being destroyed. It's something else. Can everybody put their mute on just while Paul's answering questions? Thanks. Okay, Paul. Um, and John Anderson says, agree on white dam, except the grade, unfortunately, and dominant biotite hosted there. But that's more of a comment than a question. Okay. Um, Michael Thompson says, is Tick Hill Galar Red Rock FE related, similar to that described by David Cook above? Or is it albertization or manganese or something else? It's both. So you have albertization, but you also have spectrolite. There's lots of hematite in it as well. So it's a combination of chloride. There's actually also a sodic amphibole in there that pops up from time to time. It replaces whole blend. And you get chloride and epidote and, and the whole lot together gives you that glass storm effect. But the red coloration is a combination of red rock albite alteration and hematite. 